All right, we have Trevor Immelman joining the Smiley Show. Trevor is a quite a great friend, you know, somebody that I've really gotten to know over the last couple of years, uh, r- really through broadcasting. We haven't gotten to get on the golf course yet, which is something that I'm really excited about doing at some point because Trev, I mean, I, I, I told Charlie this before. I was like, hey, you know, Char- Charlie, Trevor and I are a little bit on the pessimistic side with our golf games, like 95% of the time. But when we have that optimism, that 5%, we can't be beat. Five <laughs> percent, huh? I don't know. Maybe mine's about one percent. But uh, yeah, look, it's uh, it's such an awesome sport. Every every single time I have some sort of re- um, interaction with it, it just um, keeps showing me how great it is. You know, even mm-hmm. yesterday, watching the end of that uh, tournament at the American Express and. Seen the young kid get it done and um, add his name to um, a pretty short list of amateurs to win on the PGA Tour. Like, you're just sitting there going, man, how cool is this? This sport is just so amazing. And, um, yeah, thankful throughout my career on the course and now off the course that I've had so many cool opportunities to be able to to take advantage of. So, yeah, I, I'm not complaining. I, I love this game. I love this game. How is the game right now? Where are we on our scale of 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 freaking out on what we're working on or are we about to turn pro again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm pretty good when no one's watching, Smiley. That's sort of the extent of, of where I am right now. Uh, you know, I've had some time to, to put some work into it over the yeah. last few months. You know, I lost – event at cbs was the tour championship so i've had about four months off at home just hanging out um practicing with my son when when i can and getting out there and playing with some buddies at our course here in winter park and so my game is okay i mean you know i'm a a scratch handicap i can (laughs) i can break par around my home course but um You know, as you know, it's such a different beast. Like when you Mm -hmm. get a scorecard in your hand or when you have to enter a tournament and play, it's like, uh, you know, your your mind just starts kicking into overdrive and then the challenge becomes, you know, can, can you take any of that stuff out that, you know, from the practice, you know? all the stuff you've learned. So that's, that's the tricky part, but I still enjoy getting out there and hitting some balls and and playing some rounds with my buddies. Well, and you mentioned your son, Jacob, he just recently uh, committed to Clemson, which I know you were excited about being a very big Clemson fan Mm. and good friends with Dabo. I mean, just talk about how cool it is to see your son, not only uh, get to play this great game of golf, but also recently commit to to Clemson, uh, a school that I know you love. Yeah, it's been an awesome journey for us, uh, you know, in two departments. The first one is him falling in love with the game at a young age and Mm -hmm. uh, growing up on the PGA Tour. uh, He was born in 2006, so I was still out there playing. And uh, so he fell in love with the game, getting to know all of the guys that I was competing against and traveling week after week out on the tour. And then seeing his game develop, uh, also falling in love with Clemson University, having met many friends there and going to a ton of football games and hanging out on campus. So a dream come true for him to be able to go there and play the sport that he loves at the school that he's loved since he was a kid. I think we took him to his first football game before he was two years old. So he was indoctrinated <laughs> early uh, and got to know Dabo as a young kid and, and uh, Dabo's boys as well. So it's been such a fun ride. And now for us to get to this next level where he's finishing his senior year in high school and, and going to be able to go there and, and play a bit of golf, it's, um, it's very exciting. It's, uh, it's kind of pinch yourself mm-hmm. stuff really. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you'll see as your daughter grows up, like when, when your kids start to – realize their goals yeah uh it's um it's extremely special for the parents i'm looking forward to uh seeing anna carter on the golf course but uh, jacob so his golf game just what do y'all what's he working on what's his strengths you know what does he need to continue to develop in his game um i, I saw that he's a lefty is that uh was that just right off the bat he was grabbing things left-handed or what was the deal there yeah, both of us are, are pretty confused with the sport. I'm actually I'm actually right-handed and uh or oh, excuse me, left-handed and play right-handed. Oh, really? 
So I was switched around because when I started in South Africa, uh, we only had a right-handed set of clubs. And oh. so when my brother and I decided to take up the game, my dad was like, okay, well, there's a set of clubs in the garage. And we were saying to him, but they're right-handed. And he was like, well, do you want to play golf or not? I mean, if you want to play <laughs> golf, we've got a right-handed set of clubs. So both of us took the sport up playing right-handed. And then, you know, when I was practicing a lot and I would take Jacob out to the range when he was just, a, you know, a kid – um, and a toddler, I would sit him down next to the pile of balls mm -hmm. and then he would watch me swing. And eventually we could, when he could get up and start moving around, uh, he would just stand on the other side of the balls and hit him in the same direction. <laughs> so even though he's right-handed, he plays left-handed. So both of us have got it, got it mixed up. But, um, you know, he, he has a lot of room to improve in all facets of the game. Uh, he's, he's working on, um, some significant swing changes right now. He started working with Chris Como a couple months that. ago, yeah. which is, which is pretty exciting. And I have, um, a ton of respect for Chris and the knowledge that he has, not just of the swing, but, uh, of the body and how the you know body mm -hmm. needs to move in different golf swings. And, uh, so that's been fun because Chris and I are close friends and now to, be able to share this experience with uh, the two of them as he, as I watch him working with Jake. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, but you know you walk that that fine line of you know being a being a parent with somebody who's getting into the sport or, mm -hmm. or trying to really get to a good level at the sport of you know when you show some toughness and when you show some love and mm -hmm. uh, when to be encouraging and. And um, and went to just be brutally honest, and so uh, I think the addition of Chris working with Jacob really kind of has helped buffer some of that. So I mm. can go back just to being the supportive dad rather than trying to teach him about the game as well. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how that pans out. But yeah, he's got a lot of room to improve. He loves competing. He loves the sport. He's obviously been able to pick up a lot of different things hanging around. Uh, the tour a lot and getting to know a lot of the players. So uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I look forward to watching his journey uh, at Clemson. And, and uh, at Clemson in 2025, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the Clemson football team is going to be hosting the Bayou Bengals of LSU uh, second week of the year. And then the following year in 26, LSU is going to be hosting Clemson. So we yep. got a little home and home series to figure out who really has the true Death Valley? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We should. Uh, I'm coming. You know, we should talk. Coming. We should talk. We should talk <laughs> offline about that. <laughs> about that series. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a big couple of years. Obviously, college football has been turned on its head here in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Everyone's just trying to figure it out. And, uh, you know, Clemson hasn't quite lived up to what the fans had become accustomed to over a decade, over the last mm -hmm. two seasons, struggled just a little bit. So it's going to be fun to see how Dabo and, you know, the new coaching staff and all of these recruits respond to that. And we got we got a uh, tough schedule the next uh, few years because we've got LSU, we've got Georgia. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's going to be some big games to follow. Well, I, I hope that we'll both be at Clemson for the game. We get to hang out, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. But, but also Baton Rouge, happy to host as well. That's a that's a kind of a, a place if you haven't been. It's a it's kind of a bucket list type of experience. Uh it, it for the away team it can be a little little sketchy at times, depending on where you sit. But if you sit in the right area, you know, it could be a great experience. I, I just call it the world's largest bar in Death Valley in uh in Baton Rouge. <laughs> well I'm sure if I go with you I'll be well taken care of. And that yes. is a place I've always been interested in going to. Hopefully it's a night game. I've heard the atmosphere in Baton Rouge for it's night insane. games off the charts. Uh so yeah, that uh that does sound like a lot of fun looking forward to it uh yeah it's like golf college football which one's got its head a little bit more on the upside down i don't know you could pick <laughs> one but uh we were just talking right when you came on that uh you know you're you're heading to the farmers this week uh currently monday for a normal week for a cbs week what day are you typically heading out to the tournament uh normally what i try to do is um catch the first flight on friday morning 
And you're living here in Orlando. I'm kind of fortunate with a good airport that I can get most places direct. Mm. And, you know, if I can catch that first flight, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., somewhere in there, generally I'm at the golf course by about 11. Yeah. And so I can get to the golf course. Uh, I can get down into the TV compound. I can sit down with our producer, Sellers Shy, for 20 or 30 minutes before he then uh, goes and does that golf channel show. Mm hmm on the Friday. And so him and I can get on the same page, uh, you know, talk about what I'm thinking about for the week, what plans he has for the week. Um, and, uh, and then I'll head out onto the golf course, onto the driving range for the rest of that, um, Friday, try and pick up whatever nuggets I can pick up, make sure that there's been no changes at the course. If there have been, try and understand what they are and how they could affect the play. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I'll try and get to back to the hotel to watch some of the coverage and just start to understand, uh, you know, what these holes look like on TV. So That's that a good point. Yeah. when I'm in the booth calling it, as soon as the screen changes, I know exactly where I am and I can already get uh, like a little um, early idea of what I'm wanting to say. Mm -hmm. And then um, Friday evening is generally a room service evening for me. Uh, I will go through all of my notes, make all of my notes uh, ordinarily for the last 10 groups on Saturday. I'll have uh, some nuggets on each player in the last 10 groups and then uh, get a good night's sleep. Saturday morning, we always have our team Zoom call. We go through how the weekend is going to look. Uh, and, and that has been a great addition from our producer, Seller Shai. Uh, and for me, it has because, you know, we have such a short turnover between the Golf Channel show and the CBS show. It's just 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So all of the announcers switch out in that 15 minute uh, period, as you well know. <laughs> and so we don't have any chance for any rehearsal or anything like that. We pretty much uh, get our jackets on, get into position, and we're within five minutes of the show starting. So those Zoom calls on Saturday mornings are extremely important for us to understand exactly uh, what we're going to try and achieve mm -hmm. on that Saturday. And then we get right into it, man. Yeah, and, that's the fun uh, part, right? No, Live it's golf. So, so much fun. It's so much fun. I've been having such a blast. And 2023 was uh, such an amazing experience for me to uh, be in this new role as lead analyst for CBS. And, you know, the amount of times, like, Probably, you know, once or twice a weekend of the 20 or so events I did last year, you know, you look over during the three-hour show and you're like, man, I'm sitting next to Jim Nance right now, <laughs> you know, calling the sport that I love. It doesn't, doesn't get much better than that. So we're pumped to get, uh, get this season going. What were some of your favorite moments from last year just that stuck out that was just like, man, this is, this is too cool? There, there were a few. Obviously, the first week a year ago at Farmers, just being nervous and anxious, mm -hmm. uh, taking over from a legend in, in Sir Nick Faldo, um, only the fifth guy to have that role for CBS. So I was a little bit nervous about that, wanting to make sure I got off to a good start. Uh, and, you know, for us at CBS, there's always a little extra wrinkle at Farmers because Jim calls the action from the AFC Championship location. Oh, that's right. So he sits in a truck. I guess he'll be in Baltimore uh, calling it this weekend. And so that can throw the timing out a little bit. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not stepping on him. I'm not starting to talk while he's talking. And so the fact that he's not sitting right next to me, because ordinarily I'll sort of locate my body so I can see him out the corner of my eye and see the screens – because I just want to make sure that we're having good chemistry and I'm not stepping on him. So there's that little extra wrinkle for farmers, which made me more nervous because it was my first week last year. So that one was, uh, was interesting and fun because it was the first one. Uh, and then you go through the year. L.A. is always a blast, mm -hmm. always a blast, um, because it was one of my favorite events when I played. Just yeah. love the golf course, love Santa Monica. The field is always so strong. Uh, Masters, once again, was um, like a heightened moment because mm -hmm. 
Now all of a sudden I'm sitting down in Butler Cabin, <laughs> and, you know, calling uh, calling the masters, which was a thrill. And uh, you always feel a little extra nervousness anytime you step onto Augusta National, mm -hmm. whether you're playing or announcing or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever you're doing there. Uh, Memorial was amazing sitting up there with Jack on the weekend and just picking his brain during the broadcast, getting his opinion um, of the sport and of the golf course. Canadian Open was one of my favorites just because of the finish. Insane, and, right? <laughs> oh, man. You know, the, the atmosphere around the Canadian Open year after year is – it's one of the best on tour. There's just – no way around that. It is one of the best on tour. The Canadian fans really get out and uh, and support the tour and support their players. And then for Nick Taylor to have this chance to win, first time in like more than 50 years, Canadian uh, trying to win their national open. He commits to doing the walk and talk with us on the 15th <laughs> hole. I remember. And I mean, I was like, I'm oh just my thinking, God. I'm thinking to myself, like, there's so many different ways I can screw this moment up with my line of questioning. You know, so do you I, know I, you're winning? Yeah, I'm not wanting to like let him know where he is on the leaderboard. I'm not wanting to give him any advice. I'm not wanting to say something that gets in his head. And it was like, gosh, I was nervous, you know, going through those questions. And we had such a great camera angle on his face. Uh, our crew does such an amazing job, but you could see the look in his eye, how intense and focused he was. And um, it was pretty intimidating. I was just thinking to myself, you know, got to really be careful and tiptoe your way through this uh, to not throw him out. Because I, I knew that if this guy doesn't win this tournament, we are absolutely going to get blamed for this. I mean, <laughs> just, there's no way around it. So. You know, when we get into the playoff with Fleetwood, who's another fan favorite, and, you know, I, ha I haven't seen crowds like that in quite some time. Mm -hmm. You know, they are 10, 15, 20 deep all the way around this uh, this final hole. Which was a bad uh, hole. God, I hate deep holes. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting <laughs> hole, I would say that. You don't often see a par five where guys are hitting three and four irons off the tee. But... Uh, Man, when he made that putt, oh. the place went nuts. And we're sitting in pretty much a soundproof booth, and you could hear the reaction from the fans. And uh, it was pandemonium out there. And it was a, that was a fun moment. So that's something absolutely that jumps out to me. When people ask me about just, you know, like, do you miss playing golf? And I said, well, you know, yes, I miss competing. There's nothing better than playing good golf. But – there is something so unique and, and so cool about being a part of TV and live golf when you experience moments like that, because yeah. there's, it's, it's hard to describe being a part of the action. And, and like you said, how you have 10 nuggets on, on the last 10 groups, you know, some days you got to use all those notes, but then there's other days where you don't need a single note because the golf yes. is so good. And I think that's what makes TV so fun. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Like I like I said earlier, I love my job. I have such a blast doing it. I love every uh, little tiny thing about it. And what I like to, to tell people is absolutely uh, on, on the list of what's the best, you know, let's do like a, a podium, so to speak. <laughs> As you say, playing great golf is number one, and mm -hmm. it will never be surpassed. Mm -mm. You know, when you know that you've put the work in – and then you, you enter whatever tournament it is and you, you take that practice range stuff to the tournament and you play well and you compete well or you win. There's nothing will ever surpass that. But for me, uh, doing TV is second on the podium. Me too. Yeah. It's so much better than, than playing average or playing bad. <laughs> yes. on the and so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I love it. I absolutely love it. And, uh, you know, I hope to be able to do it for a long time. And, and you mentioned sellers and just talking about how, uh, the, the Friday before you kind of get figured out, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. And then sellers kind of comes back to you. Well, this week at the farmers, there's a whole lot to talk about. And that's, I think one of the main reasons is, is Nick Dunlap. We mentioned right off the top, you said that, I mean, just what he accomplished, 
winning as an amateur. I mean, I imagine that's going to be a, a, a huge part of y'all's discussions uh, when you get over to San Diego. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Look, we got got to get through the first two days mm-hmm. uh, where the coverage is on on Golf Channel. It's one of the um, advantages I have is you know I watch the third Thursday broadcast at home. Yep, and I get a feel for okay, how's this tournament starting to to set up? And then Friday I'm on site and I get a feel for what's going on site. And then you see uh, now what are the storylines going into the weekend? And as you say. With Nick, uh, you know, how is he going to back this up? As I'm mm-hmm. sitting here, I got the note last night that he had entered Farmers. So that's going to be amazing. Uh, I actually haven't uh, found out yet. Maybe you can tell me, like, is he playing as a pro? Or is we don't he know playing yet. We do not know yet. But so did you that, see what he jumped to in the world ranking? He, that's right. I saw him jump up like 600 spots into, what, somewhere, somewhere in the 60s or something he's like that? He's at 68. <laughs> it's it's the most it's the most absurd thing I've ever seen. I thought he was. We were, I asked Charlie last night when we did our topical recap. I was like, "Hey, we're, if I had to set an over under on what you thought Nick Dunlap's official world golf ranking would be after that win, what would you set it at?" He's like, "Ah, somewhere like around like two hundred something like that." And I was like, ah, "I think I'm like around one fifty. He's like, "Well, he's sixty eight. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. exactly right. It is it is crazy, and. Uh, you know, we'd probably need another show to debate about the merits <laughs> yes. of the world rankings and how all of that is panning out. But, it's a mess. Uh, you it's know, a mess. one of my closest buddies, Adam Scott, uh, has been playing some really good golf at late, at, of late. He's had four top tens in his last four tournaments, three of them on really? the uh, EP World Tour and one on the PGA Tour in Bermuda. Mm-hmm. And he's sitting at number 49. So you got him at 49th in the world rankings. And then, like you say, you got Nick at 68. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. But so impressive, the maturity he showed, uh, not just with his game. Look, we've, we've known about him. We've heard about him. Everybody got a glimpse of how good he is at the U.S. Amateur and in, in uh, his couple of years at Alabama. But uh, the maturity he showed in his interviews with Burko and throughout the week and things he said and the way he conducted himself, you know, even the back and forth he had with JT on the 18th hole when he blew it out into the crowds on the right-hand <laughs> side. Like, you know, he, he, was, he, was, he was so acting like a veteran out yeah. there. Yeah. And, you know, is it, is it impressive? Absolutely. Is it that surprising? No, not really, because we've seen it from a number mm-hmm. of youngsters. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at what Ludwig has been able to do in the last six or eight months and uh, what Minwoo Lee has done in the last couple mm-hmm. of years. And really, you go back to your generation of the JTs and the Spieths, and then you got the Morikawas and the Schefflers. Like, we've seen youngsters come through and be ready and be mature and – and really be smart with how they go about their business. So Nick looks like he's just following in those footsteps. It's awesome. Yeah, and, and it's kind of similar age of what Jordan Spieth was when he won at the John Deere. I mean, mm-hmm. you were the President's Cup captain at, at uh, Quail Hollow. I mean, hey, Tom Kim was a young guy. We, you just mentioned Min Woo Lee. Are, are we going to see Tom Kim and Min Woo Lee playing a match against Gordon Sargent and Nick Dunlap? Like as soon as this year at the President's Cup, like yeah. do you think it's that fast for some of these guys to make it really onto some do. of these teams? Yeah, I really do, Smiley. It's uh, it's a great point you make. The President's Cup's going to be in Canada, uh, draw Montreal. International Those fans are going to be insane. Yeah, the international <laughs> team is really pumped about that. We've got we've got the Canadian legend Mike Weir as our captain, and he's been working really hard uh, in in prep for this. But yeah, it it. It could well happen. You know, you throw Sung J.M. in there. He's still in his early 20s. Uh, we got a bunch of youngsters coming through for the international team. But that absolutely could happen. Uh, there's, there's this changing of the guard. Uh, it's fun to see. It's great to see the new talent come through these pipelines. And credit to the, the college football, uh, college golf system, mm-hmm. uh, the amateur golf system that uh, – this talent is being identified and that they're giving these guys opportunities to really get good early. I mean, that it wasn't that way when I came through. I was, you know, about 10 years before you. But uh, 
when I came through with Adam, Sergio, Luke Donald, Justin Rose, Paul Casey, that kind of group, uh, Henrik Stenson, it was more still, look, you got to get out here. you got to pay your dues for a couple <laughs> years, learn the ropes, and then you can think about playing well. Whereas, you know, now it's, uh, it's a little different. These guys come out ready to go. Yeah, I mean, just think about how many PGA Tour players used to hold cards from 35 to 45 years old. Now, if you have a card past 35 and before 45, it's 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 like you're like a hero. It's so hard to do now because the young generation that's come up made it so difficult to keep up because of the distance that these players hit it now. I, I play with college kids all the time back home. I'm like, gosh, I'm glad I'm not playing because this kid doesn't know how good he is first and foremost. Like, still beat you, but still it's like, oh man, these kids can absolutely hammer it. And, and one of those kids is, is Min Wee Wee. We just mentioned him a little bit. And I'm trying to take myself back to a year and a half ago when you were picking your President's Cup team. Was Min Wu Lee on the radar at the time? I'm trying to remember where he was in the game of golf. Yeah, absolutely he was. Um, you know, I want to be careful how I handle some well, of I, that. I, I, and forgive me because I, I, no, I'm no, trying no, to remember. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, he absolutely was. And the, the way that we like to do it on our team is um, – in the year off and then, you know, early on in the year of, which where we are now leading into the September President's Cup is we generally have a squad of about 25 players that we involve in all communications, in team dinners and team get togethers. And he was a part of those. Mm-hmm. He was a part of those. He's somebody that I really, really like. Uh, I like his charisma. I like his mm-hmm. attitude. I like his style. On the golf course, I like how he doesn't take himself too seriously, uh, and he plays with such amazing uh, enthusiasm and freedom that uh, he was he was one hundred percent on on my radar. And uh, you know, we had a turbulent time in the last couple of months uh, of of getting our team arranged because of players that were no longer eligible to make our team. Mm. And so we lost pretty much a handful of players right at the end. Uh, and I would say that, you know, there's a few players, Min Woo being one of them, Ryan Fox being another, Mackenzie Hughes, Adam Hadwin. Those were players that were so, 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 so close to getting onto mm-hmm. the team. And, um, you know, I look forward to those guys being on many teams in the future. But he, he's somebody that I honestly believe Min Woo – you know this, and I would put him in the same category as Tom Kim. Uh, could be a global superstar. Yeah. You know they have all the pieces, mm-hmm. all the pieces. They they have the experience of playing around the world. They have an understanding of traveling around the world and understanding the game's impact uh, in places other than just America. Uh, and so they've had to. Uh, really learn the ropes in a in a different way yeah. to the American kids who go through the college system, and uh, very quickly have become fan favorites. Yes. So they have that that extra that extra something, the it factor that the media loves, the fans love, and they back it up with their game. So these guys for sure have potential to be global superstars. How could you not love Tom Kim after the Presidents Cup? I mean, how could oh. you not, right? It, you know, it, it's incredible. It's incredible. I uh, he was he was put on my radar by a buddy of mine, Claude Harmon. Really? And yeah, at the end of I need to think carefully now. I was captain in twenty two. At the end of twenty one, uh, Claude was with Dustin Johnson somewhere in Asia, I believe. Oh, okay. Uh, at a golf tournament that Tom was at, and they played a practice round together and Claude immediately sent me a message and was like, you got to keep an eye on this kid. He is unbelievable. What? And I had never uh, really seen much about him, but all of a sudden I was like following his results every week and, you know, just really solid. He had been a pro for a number of years already, even though he's so young, mm-hmm. he turned pro and he was like 15 or <laughs> <No>. 16. <laughs> crazy. And, uh, and then lo and behold, the, uh, at the Scottish open, he jumped out and really should have won the tournament. Ended up finishing, I'm wanting to say, uh, third, second or third. Yeah. And then he got into the open 
and uh, I was at the Open at St. Andrews. So I, I went out and walked some holes with him in the practice round, got to know him. And uh, he just keep playing better and better. Eventually gets his tour card, wins at Wyndham. Now he's he's played his way straight onto the team. Yeah. I don't even have to pick him anymore. <laughs> you know, the first few months I was like, okay, we're going to have to pick this young kid. Now he's like, you know, one of the best players on the team. Yep. And it was so much fun to watch because – he came into the President's Cup with so much confidence that he wasn't just one of the best players, wasn't just the youngest player on the team, but he also became one of the leaders in the locker room because of this. Uh, and, it, and it's, you know, I want to explain it in the right way. It's not, it's not through arrogance, through like, you know, I'm the man, I just won at Wyndham or what have you, anything like that. He became one of the leaders because he's so much fun to be around. And he is so enthusiastic. Everything was just so much fun for him that he draws people toward him. Mm -hmm. You know, people just want to be around this guy because he's so positive and so upbeat and so happy that uh, he was kind of like the, the Pied Piper on our team. You know, wherever he was, people were following him and, and he was getting the crowd riled up. And, you know, he's one of those that gets excited when the crowd was rooting against him. Mm -hmm. He found that funny. He found that... <laughs> Uh, he found that to be like, man, this is this is what I've always wanted. I've wanted people to like, you know, be in such a big tournament that people are rooting for me and against me. Yeah, and he just loved every single little thing about it. He is uh, he's somebody that uh, I hope will be on, you know, following Adam Scott's shoes and playing like ten or eleven or twelve Presidents Cups for us. Yeah, me and you both. I mean, I think you and Luke Donald both kind of got. I, I wouldn't say lucky, but the fact that these guys played their way on the team, speaking of Tom Kim and Ludwig O'Berry, you know, these guys were probably players that you were going to take a, you know, jump out and say, you know what, I'm going to take a chance on this guy. Like this just, mm. it, I just believe in them. And then they just end up playing their way on the team. But I have a nugget for you on Tom Kim. He came onto our show and because we asked him, I was like, hey, when did like the Presence Cup ever like enter your mind? He's like, oh, man. So Trevor came out and watched me at the open and I was so nervous. <laughs> I don't know if you got that sense from him, but he said when you watch him for those couple of holes, he said he just was like barely keeping it together. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, I tell you what, he didn't show it. I caught them. I caught them on the fourth hole, which as you know, at the old course, that's probably one of the tougher par fours, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on the front side. And he had a beautiful tee shot down there. The wind was into, so he couldn't quite get it over that big grassy knoll there. But he drove it down into that tight, narrow little piece of fairway uh, just left of the bunkers. And so I was like, oh, that was pretty good. And he was playing with Siwoo Kim, who is another one of my favorites. And He's the best. They're good buddies. <laughs> and, uh, and then Tom stands up into the breeze, out of the left. It was early in the morning, kind of chilly, and he just laces this four iron onto the middle of the green. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is mm. this is the guy. Like, this is everything that I was told about him. And uh, like I said, that, that personality of his is just uh, – it's infectious. He, he's a beauty. He really is. And uh, just like uh, being a captain of the President's Cup, there's just kind of one – topic that I want to ask you about just being something that's very involved with the format and just seeing kind of how it, you know, has shaped up over the years. And Ernie else was pretty adamant about just how he wanted the format changed to make it a more, I wouldn't say competitive because it, it was a competitive presence cup at Quail Hollow. But what would be the, the one thing that you would change to the format if there was anything at all? You know, I, I don't really think we need to do much tweaking at this point. Uh, Nick Price did a great job. You know, initially when I played the President's Cup, everybody played in every match uh, in my first one. Everybody played in every match, meaning um, like every I'm day one, you had yeah, every yeah, person one, had to play? Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm thinking the first one, uh, we'll have to double check this, but I'm thinking that's how it was in the first one. In the second one that I played... Uh, maybe one team set out. Um, Has it always been four the, days? The double day, yeah. It's always been four days. Okay. But only one team set out on the double day, for sure, mm. when you've got the morning and the afternoon, uh, which is the Saturday. Yeah. 
And then Nick Price uh, did a good job of taking it to that Saturday where it was just four and then four. Like the Ryder Cup. Yeah, so we got rid of a couple points there. Uh, you know, I, and I think we're getting close. The, the, the events have been closely contested really since 2015. There was one point in it in Korea. <laughs> then, um, okay, New York was a blowout and it was almost done. On the Saturday, those boys played really well too, though. That was <laughs> you know? that was maybe maybe the best American team that's been put together. Yeah. They, were, they were pretty sharp that week, um, and uh, and then the last couple have been a little closer again. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think we've just got to step up to the plate and 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 be better and get better, and that's something that Ernie and I have worked really hard on. Like, how can we actually, you know, take ownership of this team and really turn this into like a legitimate sporting franchise. Okay, Team USA is known all over the world, and that name runs through the Olympics and all these um, gold medal winning teams, whether it be women's soccer, whether it, in the World Cup, whether it be gymnastics, swimming. You think of Michael Phelps. You think of track and field. Like Team USA is a massive, massive brand. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are still in our infancy as the international team. You could even argue that Ryder Cup Europe is a massive brand. Like people know exactly what it is. They know what tournament they're playing in. They know how well they've played in the last 15 or 20 Ryder Cups. And, and we're nowhere near that. So we have to build this brand. We have to take advantage of the uh, areas around the world that we represent. I mean, we represent more than a billion people around the world. When you start to take into account, or, you know, many billions, you start to take into account uh, that we represent China and India and all, you know, all over Australia, New Zealand and up into Japan and then across to South Africa and then South America and Canada. We need to start getting our fans really involved in this and making sure that, we still have those pipelines of all the talent from around the world that love the game of golf to funnel into this and grow up wanting to play for the international team. And when you start from the grassroots level like that, you can build something that's sustainable. And really, that's the journey that we've been on since 2019 uh, with Ernie carrying it on through my captaincy and now Mike and then the captains we have lined up after that. So... Really, that's what we're interested in, uh, and we're starting to see this young talent come through. There's a, uh, uh, a few really great youngsters in Japan as well right now, and you know if we can keep them coming to the PGA Tour and continue to qualify for our team, then um, you know we f we feel like we're going to get over the hump and win one eventually. Yeah, I think it's kind of shaping up to be a, a very good international team this year. That. You mentioned some young J Japan players, but I think it's been the young Koreans that have been so good, especially how well they mm -hmm. played at the last President's Cup. And then the Aussies, you got Minwoo Lee as well as a guy that's an up-and-comer, Cameron Davis, who I, I think the world of from a talent standpoint is going to continue to get better and better. But, man, you got some you got some wildly veterans on the Aussie side and the Canadian side that are just kind of hold the fort together because – I think that every one of those Canadian players, whether it be Corey Connors, Adam Hadwin, Nick Taylor, Mackenzie Hughes, all those guys have been there, done that, you know, um, and whether they're on the team or not, um, you expect to see a Canadian player to be there, to be kind of the, the anchor, if you will, in Montreal this year. Yeah, for sure. Look, in all our leadership meetings and get togethers, you know, we we're secretly hoping that a number of these guys qualify. Mm. <laughs> because <wouldn't> uh, <laughs> that, fan, that fan support will be second to none. It really will. And and that's one of the things that, that we have to work on, Smiley, quite honestly, is we need to be able to take more control of our home matches. I mean, you'll be able to speak to it better than anybody having been at the Ryder Cup <laughs> and how much of a home match it felt like yes. for the European. And when you're at uh, – okay, Whistling Straits was weird because it was covid uh, and so the fan numbers were a little different. But you go back to the Hazel Teens and whatever, Val Hallers, if you go back further, um, the home team has such a distinct advantage, just like in any other sport. And I would say one of the things that's been lacking in the President's Cup during its uh, the juice? couple of days, 
in history is, you know, when we have home matches, we need to be able to take control of that and uh, really create a bit of an uncomfortable feeling for the Americans for a change. You know, I don't think they've ever had that at a President's Cup. And, uh, you know, we'll be working hard to to see if we can get him to feel it a little bit in Canada. Yeah, you you, you want to see Patrick Kaley and Xander Shoffley kind of similar to like a quarterback in the NFL throwing an interception, walking off the field, and they just wa- they just lost a hole on the 14th hole to go two down, and they can't even hear themselves talk. That's what you're talking about, just that, mm-hmm. that level of – like it's so loud. It's this is uncomfortable and something we haven't felt. And and it's a challenge. You know, that US team, it's a it's a brand like you mentioned, but the partnerships that they've developed over the years is what I think makes them so tough to beat is because they've they've played together so much, but also they've been in situations as well together where they've been up, they've been down. They they just kind of know how to get it done in the end. And that's the challenge that you go up against with with this American squad. Yeah, no doubt about that. They have such a great amount of talent. And yesterday we got more proof that there's more in the pipeline. <laughs> <It's coming. laughs> uh, and so, you know, that that just is what it is. But we have to go ahead and, and, uh, and take care of our business as well. And like you say, uh, at the very least, through our fan support, and that goes back to – uh, building this franchise and starting to really get some enthusiasm and excitement from golf, international golf fans around the world that want to travel to Montreal. They want to travel to to our matches where we're hosting and really get vocal and loud and support their players. Um, you know, we we got to be able to step up and build that brand so that the American team, at, at the very least, has to pay attention to oh, it yeah. when they come up. And you developed the logo, right? The new one? That was Ernie. Oh, it was Ernie. Uh, it was Ernie. I was, was thinking Ernie. it was you. You know, the way I kind of look at it, he's he's sort of, if, if you had to equate it to the European Ryder Cup team, he's kind of like our Seve, to mm. be honest. Uh, you know, he played in a number of these, was an assistant captain in a number, and then took over uh, with the captaincy in Australia in 2019. And he noticed very quickly that we had no identity uh, we had we had nothing um, that were, we felt like was ours that we owned that we could play for. We had no logo, we had no flag. It was just you know some uh, random drawing that didn't mean anything to us. And so he came up with the shield logo, and we educated international players over a two year process of what that logo means, what it stands for, mm. uh, and you know. That that process has, has really been fun for us. And you start to see by the time we rolled around to uh, 22 when I was captain, you know, players really starting to understand that having our own team colors for our uniforms, things like that, that might sound like kind of airy, fairy, up in the air sort of stuff. But when you're in the trenches in – mega intense competition like that. You know, those are little things that you can draw on that give you confidence and you're seeing your buddies and you understand uh, what that shield means Mm. and you understand the players that came before you that represented this team. You know, those are little things that uh, edges, if you will, that really can help when you're you're in, in tough spots facing adversity out there in the tournament. Man, that's really neat. It's getting me really excited for the President's Cup, to be honest. So I kind of wish it was tomorrow. But here, we'll finish on some just some topical stuff here uh, for this PGA Tour season that I just want to kind of get your predictions on. I mean, this is the easy part because you even if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) And why don't we start with just, you know, last year we saw the West Coast swing being stars and John Rahm being one of the stars that that basically said, hey, Heading into Augusta, you're going to have to come and beat me. And nobody yep. did. Um, do, you, do you see the, a similar uh, player, you know, whether, whether it's dominating the West Coast or just putting a stamp on like, hey, I'm playing this good. You're going to have to come find me at Augusta if you're going to come beat me. Yeah, well, look, it, it should be Scotty Scheffler. Um, he's just got to, he's got to find a solution on the greens. Yeah. He's just got to find a solution on the greens. You know, you look at – uh, his putting last season, he's outside the top 160 in strokes gained mm. on the green. So, um, you know, he's 
statistically, he's one of the worst putters on the PGA Tour. Yet, he still won a couple times in the regular season. He then won uh, Tigers tournament. And you just think to yourself, the amount of times that this guy had a chance to win the tournament with nine holes to play on Sunday. Insane. And he's damn near last in putting. <laughs> like, the ball striking is Tiger-esque. Yeah. Okay? It's night and day above the rest. Mm-hmm. And now when you look at the 2024 season, he doesn't have to worry about Rom as a problem. Yeah. So if he could uh, just figure out a solution on the greens, he's, he's going to win a handful of times in my opinion. <laughs> and it's going to be interesting to watch. I have faith in Phil Kenyon. I think he's a great instructor. I've worked with him before. I really like what he does. He doesn't try and overhaul people's putting strokes. He tries to understand what they do, what they do well, what their weaknesses are, and then he works with that to help you build something that you can own. He doesn't try and fit everybody into the same mold. Mm. So I think Phil Kenyon is a great choice for Scotty to work with, and uh, we'll just have to see. But this guy is – It's unreal. So ridiculously yeah. good, Smiley. On those Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays when I'm out on the range and on the golf course, like I, I purposefully look for, okay, when is this guy playing? When do I think he's going to be on the range? And I make sure that I go and watch. It is, it's, uh, it's an experience to watch him hit the ball. I, so he's, <laughs> he's the guy that really should get it done. But there's, there's two or three uh, guys that I'm really looking to, to step up. Mm. Yeah. One is Xander Shuffley. I think it's time. Mm. I think it's time for him. You know, this he's he's sort of unheralded and not spoken about a lot. But when you look at his record, he's been he's completed seven seasons, he's won seven times. He's made it to the tour championship every single season he's been on tour. I mean, look, you and I played out on tour. That is hard to do. Very hard. To be in the top 30 year after year after year. He's done it seven seasons in a row. Um, he's been close at majors. You know, he doesn't really have glaring weaknesses in his game. Maybe every now and then he's a little bit wild off the tee, but the iron game is strong. The putting is top 10. Yes. And so, like, for me, it's time. It's time for him to really take that next step. Uh, Sung J.M., I kind of put in the same category. He's completed five seasons, made the Tour Championship all five. He's only won twice. This guy, our nickname for him in our team uh, is The Machine. The Machine. You know, this guy, he's like, he's like Iron Byron out there. You know, He's <laughs> never seen a flag. He doesn't like to shoot at. He's mega aggressive. Uh, same thing. I, you know, I want to see him start to win more often. I think the key for him is going to be putting. He can be a little... A little bit um, streaky with the putting and uh, at times with his iron play. But he has everything that you need to, you know, also win multiple times in a season. And then, and then the last guy that I just have a hunch on is, is, uh, is Adam Scott, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, in my opinion, he's had a Hall of Fame career. Yeah. He's, he's uh, won the Masters, been world number one. He's played 10 President's Cups for the international team. He's won 14 times on the PGA Tour. He's won 11 times on the European Tour. I mean, this guy's the Players' Championship. He's done everything there is to do in the game. Uh, he's 43 years old. And whenever I talk to him, he just seems really motivated yeah. to have another, another run at the top. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about him, they, they talk about his putting be the weakness, but really you're not paying attention if you think that. He's been, uh, you know, absolutely in the top half of the field in putting for about five years now. I think he was in the top 20 last season. So putting is, is not a problem for him. He still hits at a mile, one of the longer hitters out there. And uh, if he can get something going with the iron play, that was sort of a, a bit of a surprise last season. He was 143rd in strokes gained approach. And with somebody with, with that pretty of a swing that all of us, you know, are, are oogling over his swing all the time, that, that really is, um, is hard to figure out. 
He was changing irons a little bit last lot, year. Yeah. Like he was changing equipment, Y angles. I don't know if there was just something that wasn't quite right. I don't know. Very odd. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. At times he was testing two and three different sets <laughs> in the days warming up for the event. Uh, and, and when I ask him about that, he's really just uh, still not quite found something that goes through the turf the way he wants it to. Hmm. Huh. You know, I think he's at a point now in his career where he's always been one of those players that has played blades. And, you know, he's maybe looking for a little bit of help in the longer stuff. But, uh, you know, he needs the soul to react properly through the turf because he's just been a guy that's played a tiny little blade for the most part in his career. But if he can find a little something with on approach – you know, he like I say, mentally he seems so motivated, working hard and determined to get things going. So those are like my three kind of – I don't know if they're like dark no, horse pro- – No, But I, those are the three guys that I'm really looking for something special from. I had breakout – uh, star kind of written down that's Sung JM. I said, Who's going to be entering the Scotty, Rom, Victor, Rory conversation? Xander Shoffley, and uh, and then player of the year. I mean, you kind of said it. I mean, probably Scotty. That's so all the questions that I had. I mean, you, you just pretty much covered them all. And I'll add to Adam Scott as a guy that's you know a breakout candidate as well. Um, if he, if he needs help getting the club through the turf, he can come hang out with me. You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty <laughs> steep. You know, we know how to fight through it. You know, that's right. <laughs> if you ever, if you've ever been so steep and, and so stuck on the way down, Adam, and you're trying to figure out how to save it, come on, hang out with me. I got you, man. Right. Cause what bow we do, that, we just, that lead drift and beat down on that thing. We just, we just throw those arms at it. We stall. And then we just, <laughs> we just hang on for dear life, my man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for, for sure. That's exactly right. Now, you've, got to, you've got to throw this out. I'm obviously, you know, we haven't spoken about um, Rory. And yeah. He just got the big win in Dubai. Right. Look, he's always he's always the guy that uh, I still to this day say that um, when Rory plays his best, like when he's really, you know, in full flight and he gets that little bounce in his step oh, when he's yeah. walking, you know, that's the closest thing I've seen to Tiger. Mm. Uh, we just don't see it as often with Rory as we did with Tiger. Yeah. But he is uh, – he's a talent of a generation and he's, he's still playing great golf. And yeah. you look at big storylines going into 2024, you know, uh, the biggest are always like um, – Who's going to career, complete the career Grand Slam next? You know, is it going to be Rory at Augusta? Is it going to be Spieth at the PGA? Is it going to be Mickelson at the U.S. Open? Or like, uh, you know, those are cool storylines for those big weeks. Where uh, can these guys get it done and join the most elite list in in our sport? And, and lastly, just quick question on Rory. If, if it were you and, and you had an opportunity to give some Rory some advice on like, hey, you know, Rory comes up and says to you, you know, like I keep putting myself in position to win major championships and I'm just not getting it done. Is there anything that you see? Is there any advice that you would give him to help him get over the this hump of of not being able to really win a major championship, even though he continues to put himself there time after time? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. You know, if you had asked me that question four or five years ago, I would have said, yeah, I would have told him to stop playing so aggressively. Uh, at times when I was uh, when I watched him play major championships, I just felt like he took on some shots that he didn't really need to, and it kind of reminds me of when I used to speak to Jack Nicholas about playing major championships and winning major championships. Uh, you know, a big part of his strategy was making sure that he didn't make unnecessary mistakes that come through bad strategy and playing too aggressively at the wrong times because he had so much confidence in his game that he knew he was at the very least as good as the rest or better than the rest. And so that meant that he didn't have to take unnecessary risk. Right. You know, it's same as Tiger. And I felt like, you know, Rory's had these great opportunities over the last decade Mm -hmm. and at times just played a little too aggressively when he didn't need to. But in the last year or so, particularly in 23, I thought he, he 
started to dial that back. In fact, at the US Open at LACC, I thought his strategy and his choices were perfect. Yeah. Now it's just a matter of, gosh, he's got to run into a hot putter on a Sunday. Got to have a hot putter it's on Sunday. You know, you think back to the lead he coughed up at the 150th Open at St. Andrews. Mm. Um, yep. You know, didn't didn't get anything going there at the old course. LACC, same thing, had all these opportunities on Sunday, couldn't buy a putt, mm. and then add to that a, a, a poor wedge shot at the par 5, 14, yep. I think it was. Yep. You know, now it's just a matter of, okay, hold that same patience and, you know, let's run into a hot putter on Sunday and uh, he should be able to get it done. And and it's almost like you get the feeling like if he can win one more, mm. he's probably going to win four or five more. Right. I just think it's just the monkey on his back right now. Yeah. But everybody talks about it all the time. Yeah. And in a way, he's a little bit unlucky because – you know, we have such a long break now between the Open and the Masters. Yep. You know, what are we going from July to April? And it's everything, you know, all he hears for all that time. And then the month leading up to uh, the Masters when he's busy playing massive events in the Florida Swing, you know, Arnold Palmer, the players, people are still asking him if he's going to be able to get it done at the Masters. And by the time he gets there, it's just like – the whole world is on fire with whether this guy is going to win the green jacket because we've all believed for so long that this course is built for him. Yeah. And so it's kind of unlucky that from the end of July till early April, it's all he's got to hear about. It must be, must be quite taxing mentally, really, if you, for a second have to try and put yourself into his shoes. I mean, Trev, I think you and I could have beat him best ball last year at Augusta. <laughs> that's right he didn't he didn't make the weekend which uh us at cbs weren't that happy about no, because he's such no. a huge draw card and <laughs> you know can you imagine how there's very f- few people that can move the people and move the needle like tiger uh in fact there's nobody <laughs> let's just be quite honest yeah but uh it would be be pretty close, I think, if Rory came down the final nine at Augusta and have a real shot because people all over the world, they love him, man. They love him. Mm-hmm. He is so popular. Well, man, Trav, this was, this was fun. You know, we, we, we covered it all. We talked Clemson. We talked President's Cup. We talked Breakout, uh, PGA Tour stars, and we talked about the stars. So as you get ready for the Farmers, I'm excited to watch you guys on CBS. Uh, I remember last year I just had Anna Carter and got to watch the entire swing on CBS, and y'all do such a great job over there. And uh, very much looking forward to uh, watching y'all get the call and uh, safe travels out there to the Farmers. But as always... I appreciate I appreciate you and everything that all the advice you've given me over the last year in broadcasting. It's definitely really helped, uh, kind of helped my growth from a very from from point zero. You know, there was there was nowhere to go but up. But you and Kurt were were there for me definitely to try to uh, improve in broadcasting. So I thank you for that and and safe travels to you and hope we can do this again sometime. Yeah, I appreciate that, Smiley. Uh, Kurt Byram, he's the best. The best. He he's, <laughs> he, uh, he's taken. A lot of people under his wing, including me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you've done an amazing job. You're crushing Thanks, it Jeff. out there. And uh, it's awesome to hang out with you guys and, and talk about this awesome sport that we love so much. So thanks for having me on. Anytime, man. See you, buddy. All right, brother. I've actually watched a couple of episodes of, of, of y'all earlier, and uh, you guys have some good takes. So thanks for, uh, thanks for what you guys do. It's cool to see what you guys are doing. And uh, I, I know golf fans appreciate it, but we, we do too. So please keep it up. I think you're doing a tremendous job. And, and you know, I listen to this podcast. It's really cool. And 